Well, we're here with DC Comics artist Freddie Williams for a review that's months in the making. Yeah, months in the making. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for having me, by the way, and I, I appreciate you dealing with all the reschedules and even today. It's been nuts, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> this is, yeah, the universe did not want you to come no. to our studio to talk about the Teenage Mutant yeah, Ninja or, Turtles movie. Or needed to put us here at the exact right time for us to make the best review mm. of the, the Ninja Turtles 1990 film. <laughs> We'll go with that. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to assume this will be an epic episode. <laughs> the making of it will just be a story that is told for the ages. <laughs> they got together to talk about the 1990 Ninja Turtles live action film. Whoops. Is it okay if we talk about the comics as well? So, I, we're gonna I, have to, it, man. Yeah, that's fine. It's we're such absolutely a gonna have to. Well, that that's a good place to start because the the nineteen ninety Ninja Turtles movie. I went to see it as a little child, and I was familiar with the cartoon. Come on, we gotta get out of here. And so I was kind of confused by the movie, and then it was later I found out. Oh, it's closer to the comic book. See, I, I had the opposite experience of you, because I, I was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fan, but from the time I discovered the comics, mm -hmm. I was a far bigger fan of the comics. Yeah. So when the movie came out, I was pleasantly surprised and stuck close to the comics. They didn't, they didn't kidify it? Yeah. Come on, let's annihilate those turkeys! They did a little bit. It's, yeah, like, they it's very some. much a hybrid between the, the original comics and the cartoon. Yeah, April O'Neil wearing the the yellow raincoat. That's something that came out of the cartoon instead of the comics. Um, her being, no, her being news a news reporter. reporter. Yeah, stuff like that. So I think that the first movie, the 1990 film, did such a great job of balancing those elements. Um, and my first experience to the Ninja Turtles was the role-playing game that came out, <laughs> Palladium Books. Oh. Um, yeah, that came out, that was the very first licensing deal that Ninja Turtles ever had. And it was before all of the craziness that blew them up. This was- Was it before earlier, the cartoon even? Yeah, well before it. I had an older cousin who was really into the role-playing games. And so he was showing me, he had like this big stack of books and he was going through them and showing them to me. And he was like, Ninjas and Super Spies, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And he went to the next one. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Go back to that. What was that? Because it was such a weird combination of syllables. For me, it was a fateful trip to Sam's Club. <laughs> really? <laughs> was, Sam's yes. Club had the comics? Bizarrely enough, they did. Because I was familiar with the cartoon. I think you know, everyone was. It, was. it was pretty big. And uh, I was vaguely aware of, like, you know, the art they use for the cover of a Nintendo game, that yeah. slightly odd style of Ninja Turtles art. And sometimes they all had red headbands for some mm -hmm. reason. And I was at Sam's Club with the family, and they had just big packs of, like, bundled four volumes of Ninja Turtle reprints. Wow. There, yeah. And some, some asshole had, like, ripped open the collected pack <laughs> of them. And so, you know, it was a loose issue, and I just picked it up. And it was actually the the issue where Leonardo gets the shit beat out of him by the Foot Clan. That Are you of, serious? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Oh my God, this is the most awesome thing I have ever read." And that's in the movie. There's something similar, but it's Raphael. Yeah, yeah. Raphael yeah, yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Okay. So in the comic, I, I mean, that's the. I think that is the best, the best Ninja Turtles story that exists in ever, but specifically in the comics. Uh, that's called "What Goes Around Comes Around." And that's my favorite Ninja Turtles story of all time. And it's, it's similar to when Raphael goes out in the movie and he's there like blow off some steam and he's on the rooftop. But it's, instead it's Leonardo and it's Christmas time and he's out in the city. He's first, he's training and then the Foot Clan start ambushing him from different like buildings from different blind corners. And they and so keep cutting back and forth like the rest of them, April and the other turtles are having like a Christmas celebration. I can't believe that was your first. That's that was, so cool. That's, yeah. that's the one that would grip you forever. You'll never get another, a better story <laughs> no. than that though. I mean, there's no. a lot of good stories, but that I think is the best for sure. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. So in, in the 1990s film, they used a bunch of Mirage comics as the, the foundation, a very strong foundation. Uh, what goes around comes around. The uh, Raphael one shot, which introduced Casey Jones, and then um, I think issue eight and nine, which was kind of like the whenever uh, Leonardo has been ambushed in the junkyard, and then they cut away. They cut away at the reveal of the Shredder having returned 
because he was dead in the first issue of the very first Ninja Turtles. Did Leonardo. Casey Jones just murder him? Like he does in the mo at the end of the movie? Oops! Actually, <laughs> in the, he crushes them in a garbage In the, in the very first issue of the Ninja Turtles, because it was meant as a one-off gag. Yeah. Like, they, well, that's that's something we should talk about. The fact that this was done as a, as a lark, yeah, and now it's been a franchise that's gone on for decades. What what started off as two guys doodling became a Daredevil parody, mm -hmm. because uh, Daredevil fights a ninja clan called the Hand. Right. What? what? The foot. <laughs> and so the Ninja Turtles, whose origin mirrors Daredevils. Yeah. Because like supposedly the canister of ooze that blinds Daredevil mm -hmm. is the canister, same canister of ooze that mutates the Ninja Turtles. Right. Yeah. And Daredevil's origin is he gets hit in the head with a canister of radioactive waste. In the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles origin from the original comic books, a can of radioactive waste hits a man in the head and then bounces in the sewers. Yeah. Yeah. This comic was done basically as a joke, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But the, but it wasn't a humorous comic necessarily. Well, the, right? the joke was we're doing this grim, serious stuff, but they're they're teenage. But turtles. they're called teenage mutant. Ninja yeah, turtles. they're they're yeah. turtles, but they can be acrobatic and flip around and stuff like that, which yeah. is part and, of the joke. And as that's well. that's when the movie's at its best is when because the movie is so much more like drab visually and grim mm -hmm. and relatively serious. And if you watch any scene from the movie that doesn't have the Ninja Turtles in it, you would not guess that it's a movie about you know, guys in rubber suits. I, that's a really good point. Awkwardly fighting. Yeah. Uh, so the, the just the visual absurdity of them <laughs> is the joke, which is why in rewatching the movie, I, I watched it for the first time in probably 15, 20 years mm -hmm. in preparation for this. And that's the best stuff in the movie when it's just played mostly straight, but then it adds like goofy sound effects. I think it, that it really does strike the, the most fair and probably perfect balance of having some goofy elements, but it's very gritty. I mean, it's very, it's shot in a way that looks like, uh, I'm not really, I'm not, I'm kind of drawing a blank on a movie that would be visually s similar, but it looks like an adult movie for lack of a better term. It doesn't yeah. look like it's phrased for kids, for for kids to be like, mommy, take me to see that because it's, it's shot in such really heavy shadows. It's got a nice thick film grain. Yeah, um, lots of backlighting. Yeah. Um, just, I always, it's funny, I always think of it as being like a super New York movie. Mm -hmm. I had no idea until researching for this, because like I said, I hadn't seen it in so long. Most of it was shot in North Carolina. I didn't know that either. I had no idea. I always think of it as being so New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have all those little, like, fun little bits with New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. and, like when Raphael flips over the front of the cab, and he's like, yeah, it's a big turtle in a trench coat. <laughs> what the heck was that? Looked like sort of a big turtle in a trench coat. You're going to LaGuardia, right? The animals are knocking down the telephone poles. What do we do if they come over here? Let them get their own cab. How much creative control did Eastman and Laird have, have over the movie? I'm assuming it was a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so because they're they're interesting people to me because mm -hmm. they made a you know I'm sure they made a ton of money off of this. An outrageous amount of money. They also really seemed to care though because mm -hmm. from the time the cartoon came out. You think it would have been really easy for them to say, yeah, just do it like the cartoon. Yeah, fine. Give us, yeah, can we cut that money? Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. That's a perfect Shower impression. Me with $100 bills. <laughs> right. But it's like. No, they, they saved that for the sequel. They That's when they me. stopped caring. <laughs> Okay, so I, I got to draw, I've gotten to draw a lot of Ninja Turtles stuff. So Batman Ninja Turtles is the thing that I'm probably the most known for, a uh, very popular crossover. And then I've gotten to draw a bunch of Ninja Turtle related stuff, lots of covers and some short stuff. So I've, in that process, I've been lucky enough to get to meet and become friends with Kevin Eastman. I have not met uh, Peter Laird. He doesn't do many conventions. He doesn't travel much. So I'm not usually in his neck of the woods. And I think he's largely detached from actual production of comics and stuff. But, but Kevin is very much in the thick of it still. And he loves, he still loves the Ninja Turtles. He's still a very, you know, an, an old uh, piece of advice of never meet your your heroes because they'll disappoint you. And Kevin does not disappoint. He, he totally disproves that part that he's, if you ever have a chance to meet him at a convention, he's just enthusiastic and great. Anyway, he's, he's, he's a friend of mine and I'm lucky that I've gotten to meet him through this and, and be so happy that he's so, <laughs> such a nice guy, uh, you know. Uh, and so he's still genuinely interested in doing the Ninja Turtle stuff. So whenever it came time for that first movie, because they were, uh, Eastman and Laird were very much in full control over the property, 
they had a lot of input, so they were basically pushing it to be as close to the, the comics as possible, the Mirage comics. Um, but I think that they use, in retrospect now, because I've been thinking to myself ever since we were talking about doing this review when we first started talking about it 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what, what would I have suggested for movies two, three, four if we could somehow route it back to the Mirage comics? But I think that really the best parts, the ones that are the most accessible to the general public were used in that first movie. Because after that, the plot lines get much more sci-fi and fan fantastical and mystical and it Alien spins triceratopses out. and Yeah. It's a fun shit. It would be, I mean, it is really fun. Well, it's stuff you could do now, yeah, not technology, then. but not then, yeah. yeah. They could barely do the Ninja Turtles then. Suck it to me, baby. So in the first ever Mirage comic, Shredder was killed. He was killed by, on a rooftop battle. Um, he's being defeated because there's four Ninja Turtles, so he's worn down. Um, but because he knows he's about to die, Shredder pulls out a thermite grenade. So this is different than in the movie. Um, and Donatello, from across the rooftop, he just throws his bow staff and hits Shredder right in his mouth, in his face and he falls over the side of the building and the thermite grenade blows up either on the way down or once he hits the, ba you know, the, the bottom of the alleyway, the floor. And that's how he's dead. The, the turtles come down and they like pick up his armor and they're like, you know, he's, he's totally dead. Mm -hmm. um, that's the actual dialogue. They look at the camera and they say, he's totally dead, he'll never come back. Uh, <laughs> but then in What Goes Around Comes Around, the Leonardo one shot, Shredder, Reemerges. The shocking reveal. No, he's still right. around. And of course, that's typical in comics and stuff. But for for Eastman and Laird, who hadn't been doing, um, they hadn't really gotten into that trope of reusing characters that are coming back. You know, okay. So I, when I was thinking to myself, what would make sense for if if I had rewritten the the movies, trying to think of this as an experiment, um, more yo-yos, <laughs> <laughs> more sausages. <laughs> But I thought to myself, well, how would you explain from the first movie to the second movie, Shredder's Return? So I just thought, well, what did they do in the comic? And I was thinking, like, uh, did they ever explain it? So I was at a signing with Kevin. We were both signing and doing sketches. It was like a private thing, so we could just... Let me see if I can do remember. Do you remember? He was, it was like worms. <gasps> You do? Oh my God. They, 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 they fed the, the body parts to worms and then Mystic Ninja stuff happens and the worms eat each other <laughs> and a shredder forms out of this. <laughs> you are fucking right. Is he like a zombie? <laughs> No, no, it just comes back normal. No. There's some failed experiments. <sighs> yes, there's a like... forearm one, and there's a real big one that's like the size of Colossus and stuff from that these. That kind of happens at the end of the second movie. There's the super shredder. Yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, visually there's a there's a similarity. So I, I lean over to Kevin, and I was like, hey. Um, oh, first, I, I'm sorry, I texted him the week before, and I was like, how did, how did Shredder come back? And he didn't reply. He was replying <laughs> to other stuff in texts. <laughs> and then we, we end up at the, the signing, so I brought it up to him again. And he, he starts laughing. He actually looks a little embarrassed by it. And he goes, uh, well, we just, he was like, you know, it's, it's comics, so characters can come back. And I was like, yeah, but how did he come back? And he said, <laughs> well, we had just read something about these worms that when they eat stuff, they like take on the genetic traits of the thing it eats. And as he's saying that, I was like, slowly looking at him like, where is this going? <laughs> worms. And he said, so, you know, there was like three different shredders. I was like, oh yeah, I remember the one that had the forearms. He goes, yeah, well, well each of those were like, there's like these space worms that <laughs> <laughs> basically the Foot Clan, to try to bring Shredder back, fed his remains to these space worms and they genetically cloned him. And I was, I couldn't stop laughing at this. <laughs> I just kept going space worms and I was like maybe I didn't want to know this I am shocked that you knew this how did you did you actually I, read all the way I through I love those fucking comic books <laughs> oh I thought you were gonna say I love those space worms I love those space worms man <laughs> that goes without saying I think the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is such an insanely versatile concept I mean, that, the brilliance of it is you can do anything with it and you can get away with something silly like that like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you can do serious gritty stuff, you focus on the ninja aspect, or you can do silly stuff. You, you can focus on the mutant ninjas, uh, the teenage ninja, uh, yeah, teenage yeah. mutant stuff, and just do goofy shit. Yeah. It's a weirdly versatile idea where they can do gritty crime stories and funky space shit and mysticism, and you can do worms. 
<laughs> you can do worms. The idea is just, it, it, you can do whatever with the Teenage yeah. Mutant Ninja Turtles. It does not matter. Well, it, it all the, fits. The foundation for it is just something that was done as a joke. Yeah. And I feel like now, at least as far as, I don't know about the comics, I know they're still going on, but as, as far as like cartoons and then the recent Michael Bay movies, they all kind of follow a more sort of just like focused, kitty-friendly version uh, I guess just based on still going back to the cartoon being so popular. Yeah. It's popular with kids, so. Yeah. You have a couple of generations who mainly know the cartoon or the 2012 cartoon yeah. or the, the CG one. Which I saw that once. I remember it being pretty good. Mm -hmm. I've seen like the first two and a half, maybe three seasons, so maybe. It... No. Uh, oh, I'm talking about, are you talking about the movie? Uh, uh, the movie is good, but I was talking about there's a, there's a. Uh, animated cartoon series that Nickelodeon did that was CG. Oh, okay. And yeah, it was similar to, but not as dark and not as labored as the 2007 movie where it wasn't as rendered and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but it was uh, still CG, a little bit more primitive. But it, it, it was actually a good series, though. Mm. Um, the first time I saw any part of that, we had uh, flown to Australia for a convention, and you want to stay up late so that you can basically get back onto their sleep schedule so you don't have jet lag. And so I was like, let me just try to find anything to keep my brain interested because I was so tired. And I was sketching, but we saw a Ninja Turtle, so we were like, well, what's this? And it was Michelangelo, and he, to disguise himself, to go outside, he put a mask of his own head on, like his, a Michelangelo mask over his Michelangelo face so he could be in disguise and going out. And it actually felt, I felt like I was hallucinating. I was like, this is so bizarre. But it was really funny, and it's, that's a real episode. I didn't make that up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, they, they oftentimes, I think there's a couple generations of, of fans that got into the kitty aspects of it, and so be it. It's, that's cool. Well, if, that's how I got into it. We got a score to settle with you little twipes. And then going, then when the movie came out, I remember I saw the movie, I think opening weekend, and it was at, a, at the mall movie theater, because mm -hmm. malls used to exist. <laughs> and the line for the box office went like all the way down the mall. Really? So in my mind, this was like the biggest movie. This is like Star Wars. Mm -hmm. When you see like the opening you know, lines for people trying to get tickets for Star Wars. It was like that, but it was for the Ninja Turtles. <laughs> As a fan of the cartoon, what was your reaction? I loved the movie. Okay. But I was also confused at parts of it. Like early on, Splinter's talking about my, my Master Yoshi. A pet of my Master Yoshi, mimicking his movements from my cage. I was like, but he's Yoshi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because in the cartoon, he's just a man that mutates into a rat. I think that actually is a better, that's an improvement. In my opinion, of the lore, I think it makes more sense for him to have been a ninja master as a human than he gets mutated down to as a rat. As opposed to him being a rat that's trying to replicate <laughs> his master's moves. One, one issue joke. Well, that's, yeah, that, that that's, grew yeah. out of control. And I think that works in the movie, too. Like I said, the, the visual absurdity without actually having jokes or even trying to be silly. Mm -hmm. That's the best stuff of the movie. Pork rind. Pork rind. Uh, and I, 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 like, I, I, like, you mentioned that Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird had mm -hmm. a lot of input in the movie. Yeah, they did. And I was looking up the director, Steve Barron. It was his first feature. He did a ton of music videos before it. He did like the famous Aha Take On Me oh, yeah. animated music video. That's he a great that. video. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was reading that he was almost fired from, from the movie for issues of tone, for making it too dark and too grim. Oh. And I think you see that like in rewatching the movie now with kind of my older brain and thinking about it as like an editor. Yeah. I'm picturing, and there's three editors on the movie because they kept firing the editors too. <laughs> One of them is uh, Sally Menke, who is Quentin Tarantino's editor. Oh, okay. Yeah. Until she passed away. She yeah. did all of his movies. But I was watching the movie, and I was like, it feels like there's parts where like there's goofy sound effects, mm -hmm. or the music is very lighthearted in certain parts. It all feels things like, they were, like the studio was trying to do in post-production to lighten the mood. That makes sense. Because the cartoon was popular, and we can't make this quite so dark. Yeah. So there's things where that's just all like post-production stuff that feels like... Yeah, we gotta do things to lighten this up. Splinter pizza lands on his head. We'll add a cartoon splat sound effects. Whoops. And that's the stuff that has held up the least, like in rewatching it. I was like, that, I, I really like everything on the farm, all the farmhouse yeah. stuff. That's from the comics. That's all, like, that's the best stuff in the movie. There's yeah. no, I mean, there's jokes, but it's all, like, character driven and mm -hmm. dialogue driven. Yeah. Well, to me, it, it balances perfect as far as the 
you know, whether it was added in post or, or not, the, the little punctuations of goofiness, including the shredder, or, I'm sorry, the splinter thing, not the shredder, uh, including, you know, splinter having a piece of cheese pizza, which looks really good, by the way. Every time I see that, I think, <laughs> I want some of that pizza. All that Domino's pizza. There's even a very small cameo by the Noid. Uh, is there? Yeah. When, Do when what uh, is he? Michelangelo is ordering the pizza, mm -hmm. there's a little Noid. It's your call. You can enjoy the fresh baked quality from Domino's Pizza or take your chances with the Noid. I didn't know that. I never know. This is the first time I've watched the movie in HD because I haven't seen it since maybe I saw the DVD. Oh, is there an HD release that I haven't? Maybe yeah, I haven't yeah, seen it. Yeah, it's in HD okay. now. And you can see that Noid. You can see at one <laughs> point Donatello day. laughs so loud that his mouth opens and you can see the, <laughs> the stunt performer's face inside the mouth. <laughs> it's very disturbing. As far as the tone punctuated with little moments of comedy worked perfectly, at least for me. Um, I was a fan of the role-playing game, then the reprinted Mirage books, then the cartoon came out, and I thought like, ah, th that first like six issues, or six issues, the first six episodes were pretty strong, a good animation of the cartoon and stuff. Oh, then they got super cheap. They got really cheap, because <laughs> they were doing like 30 or 40 episodes per season. You do the first six, you sell the show. Yeah. And then you mass produce that shit. Yeah. And yeah, I remember the, like I haven't watched them since I was a kid, but I remember even before I kind of understood the, you know, technique of animation, I was like, the early episodes, like they look really good, mm -hmm. and then, even as a little kid, you can tell something changed. Yeah. Now, what's the deal? Because I know in Europe, they're called the Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Mm -hmm. It's just like ninja, just like a forbidden thing overseas or what? <laughs> I'm not sure if it's the word ninja um, specifically is forbidden or not. I, I, so you're absolutely right. It is called Teenage Mutant Hero Turtles. Um, and at some point, Michelangelo could not use his nunchucks. He had to use like a grapple hook in later seasons and stuff as a... Uh, some similar, it was like, I think the word ninja essentially means assassin. Yeah. It implies something very violent. Well, like, even here, something. that was an issue. I know parents were upset about the, the amount of violence, which is why both the cartoon and the sequels to the movie, that, that's when they had to get rid of their weapons. And that's why the second movie, they're using yo-yos and sausages. <laughs> and the cartoon, the same way. They didn't, they didn't use their weapons ever in the cartoon. It was like, it's like the end of the 80s or something. Because like in the 80s, they made a fucking kid show on Rambo. Yeah, yeah. From the canyons of skyscrapers to the canyons of remote mountain peaks, Liberty's champion is unstoppable. Rambo. I think it was it was worse with the Ninja Turtles because it was so explicitly aimed at kids. And kids were, I mean, I was doing it, my friends were doing it. We were playing ninja in the, you know, in the driveway. And it was too violent. So Do you have any footage of this? I'd love to see this. I don't have any footage of this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would be awesome. I didn't even have any photos. I had flipping. so many Ninja Turtle toys. Ninja Turtles was the first, like when I was really little, you know, I had He-Man, He-Man action figures and yeah. stuff. But Ninja Turtles was the first, like, pop culture thing where I was like, this is my thing. I'm gonna get all these. Well, He-Man and, and the Ninja Turtles go together pretty well, the, the action figures. They're of similar Size -wise, proportions yeah, and stuff, yeah. yeah. So. I was reading up, and that's a big part of why the movie had, the Ninja Turtles movie had trouble getting made, is like it, every studio turned down because of, they were worried that it would be another Masters of the Universe type disaster. And it probably didn't help that the concept is so goofy. See, that's strange to me, because when they made the Masters of the Universe movie, that felt like it was about four years too late. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the Ninja Turtles, when they made that, the turtles were still red hot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, if you're if you're somebody who's over, you know, who's overseeing millions of dollars to invest in something, you might just go. You might not be be paying attention to that specific time frame. You're just like, I don't know. It's the kids' cartoon that gets turned into a movie and loses us a bunch of money and kills both kills the franchise and our studio at the same time. <laughs> I know that in retrospect it seems like such a weird combination of elements, but I guess it hit me at just the right time that it's like I already knew what ninjas were because I had seen, a, um, what was it, uh, American Ninja or something? There was some, oh, sure. There's some ninja movies that I remember seeing oh, a lot. And of course, a ton Enter the Dragon. Of 80s and stuff. ninjas movies. Yeah. yeah. And even though there's not a specific ninja in like Enter the Dragon, he's still very ninja, and Bruce Lee is very ninja-esque and yeah. stuff the like that. Yeah, martial arts in general at that time were, were popular. So it's like that to me is a given. It's like, 
that's accepted into the kid Freddy's brain. And then mutants, I, I love the X-Men, and there's mutant animals in that, so that's okay. And then there's, you know, sci-fi stuff. So it was like, to me, it was just like, this is just a cool combination of stuff. But like any adult watching that or reading it, in, in an office with a three-piece suit and he's going over budgets, proposed budgets, he's gotta be like, what? <laughs> what? Get this out of here, what are you doing? You're fired actually for bringing this to me. You know? I, I think they got most kids with just the theme song. <laughs> Which appears nowhere in the movie. To their credit, it would have been very, they, I was shocked at the opening logo. They're, they're walking down the sewer, you just see their silhouette. Da -da, they jump into freeze frames. Yeah. And then the logo comes out, and it's the same logo from the cartoon. And I was trying to think if I'd ever seen, you could see the little R, the little registered trademark <laughs> thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's, that, like, do you ever see that in any other movie based on something where they just put the trademark right on the opening title card of the movie? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I, that stuck out to me because it's like, I don't think I've ever seen that before. It's funny. You see that and then the rest of the movie has so much integrity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, it would have been easy to make. I just keep thinking of the second movie. The second movie is what your worst fears of what the first movie could have been. Vanilla Ice and all that crap and just the, the cartoony goofy big, tone. Big goofy monsters, overly yeah. cartoony. Oh, you can't you can't use your weapons. You gotta throw sausages at the enemies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the biggest shock in rewatching the first one is from Splinter's very first scene, he's constantly beating it into their heads like, I'm gonna die someday. You are still young, but one day I will be gone. Use my teachings wisely. You're children, and I'm telling you this. Mm -hmm. It's almost a shock that he doesn't die at the end of the movie. I mean, I understand why he wouldn't, because yeah. it's a franchise, but it's beaten into him so much where it almost feels like that's what it's leading up to. It feels is, like there's a lot of gravity to that, and he yeah. feels pretty frail. And it's played so straight, yeah. and again, that visual absurdity, like there's that great scene where the camera's spinning around him and Raphael, mm -hmm. and it's like right in their face. I am here, my son. And the animatronics are great because it's Jim Henson's company. Yeah. That, there's a specific shot where Splinter is sitting on his chair and he's telling Raphael to like kneel or listen now. And he's mm -hmm. like, when he says the word now, his tail also gesticulates with his hand. Goodness, wait till morning. You will listen now. And I just noticed, because I rewatched it. I've watched that movie probably a hundred times and I've never <laughs> noticed that. And I rewound, I was like, that's so cute. Look at that. They, somebody controlled his tail yeah. to make him make his point more firm. Um, <laughs> I thought that was great. Well, that's the higher Jim Henson's company. That's what you get. That's uh, Kevin clashed at Splinter who went on to do Elmo, which mm -hmm. is so weird. But uh, <laughs> that was another thing I was excited about with the movie was the fact that it was Jim Henson and such an odd project for him to work on. And this is before he died, right? It was one of the last yeah. things he did before he died. Yeah. But it's so, yeah, it is grim, it is violent. It's not anything like, you know, the stuff that he was most more closely associated yeah. with. Um, and I think he kind of did it as a favor to the director because the director did episodes of The Storyteller, if you ever saw that. I have not seen that. ABC series. Uh, it's a good show. Is that a Jim Henson puppet? Thing? Yeah, yeah, that okay. was all, that was like one of, because Jim Henson, towards the end of his career, he, wanted, he was getting more sort of ambitious with animatronics and stuff, and so he did the storyteller. Wasn't it like a segment on a weird rebooted Muppet show? The first half of the show was, yeah, the Muppets running a The Muppets TV running a TV studio, station, yeah. And then the second half was the storyteller, which was these, like, you know, fantasy stories, an Something more show. in the vein of Dark Crystal. Yeah. Yeah, or Labyrinth. Yeah, and so the director of this went on to do that, so he's like, Jim, come give me a hand. <laughs> I, Make these turtles Help me do for these me. fucking turtles. Yeah. I have no idea how to do fucking turtles. <laughs> <laughs> We've got, uh, oh, there's, there's a number of motors, and we're using a lot of radio control. We even tie a computer up with each of those characters and a, and a puppeteer operating the computer. But their design is great, too, because they all look, they're all distinct. Yeah. There's, there's like, slight variations to the sculpts of each of them. Like, Donatello's a little more kind of boxy shaped. Mm -hmm. Michelangelo is rounder features he's like the cutest looking one yeah and then Raphael's got like a little scar on it like they all have different shapes it would have been so easy to just, eh, just sculpt a head and they'll all look like that yeah they're turtles who cares yeah yeah and if you look at the cartoon they all look the same and even most of the early Mirage they all looked identical yeah. um, there was no difference cartoon. I think the main delineation in the Mirage books which were black and white which other than the cover and the cover was monochrome red it wasn't even 
like even in that, you couldn't really tell them, like if they had had different color green skin or anything like that. But in any case, on the inside, it was, they all looked identical, all four of the turtles, except for they had different weapons. And really the, I think, um, I think later on they added Donatello's strap, the real big thick singular strap. Mm -hmm. But um, in the all the Mirage books, um, Leo has the the thin straps. He was really the only visually different one. Mm -hmm. If you showed like a close up of any of their faces, unless it was Leo, where you could see the scabbards on his back, um, you you don't know. I yeah. mean, unless they're holding their nunchucks up in camera or holding up you know Raph's size or something in camera, you would just not know other than contextual clues from the dialogue or something like that. Help each other. Draw upon one another, and always remember the true force that binds you. In the in the nineteen nineties film, when they go to the uh, when they go to the farm, I get a little bit choked up every time they make astral uh, connection to Splinter. Like they meditate, and then oh, yeah. he like tells them that he loves them and stuff. And then Raphael and uh, Mikey, maybe or Michelangelo is to like cry. outwardly, yeah, he's like blatantly crying. Yeah, which is he's been the just the comic relief through the whole movie. He's just been completely goofy. So yeah. to see him like get emotional like that, it is kind of shocking. And, mm -hmm. and again, because it's great, Jim Henson animatronics, they all have such personality. They do so expressive. Where a scene like that really works. But even as an elderly man now. I still, when I watch it, I get like, I'm like, oh, like it actually, it touches me and it's, you know, such a, an old film, but it was done so well, you know. Um, so the, in, in um, the, the farm scene, Michelangelo, it was supposed to in the original script, supposed to go into a darker character turn where he was supposed to become more grim and not be as jokey. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at, there's two scenes that in the edit, they voiced it over with Raphael's voice to make it Raph instead. Um, there's the scene where there's a turtle who it's shot as Mikey, but it's voiced over as Raph on top of the, the barn and he throws his hands up and he yells splinter. Oh um, yeah! If you look close, that's those are nunchucks, and that's Mikey. Oh. And the same thing. There's another shot inside of the barn. I'm not sure. I think he's uh, Mikey is punching the uh, what is it called? The bag that you hit. What's that called? <laughs> a punching bag. A punch bag. A punch bag. The bag that you hit the is the official title. <laughs> um, but that was yeah. That was supposed to be Mikey. It was basically a subplot that they cut out. I think to streamline things, and they just made it where. See, that's interesting because there's one of the things that really stuck out in rewatching it was that early scene after Splinter is like, someday I won't be here. Mm -hmm. And uh, Michelangelo is waiting for the pizza guy to show up. And Donatello comes up to him and they have this like quiet little moment. Did you ever think about what Splinter said tonight? You know, not having him? Hmm. But Mikey just kind of blows it off there. He's like, he's like, ah, oh, pizza dude's got 30 seconds. It's almost like he doesn't want to deal with that. Yeah. So it kind of ties in with, yeah, if he, like he's he's bottling this up, like the actual thought of responsibility. That's like I said, all the best stuff is the farmhouse stuff, and it feels long. So it's interesting that it would have been even longer. Yeah, I'm not sure how much <laughs> how much they actually shot or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, and the only reason I know that is because Kevin was talking about it. He mm. was describing it. Time's up. Three bucks off. I, I I don't know if it's because I'm older, but uh, I watched this and I think Splinter is my favorite character in this. Well, he works He's more interesting than the turtles. Yeah, well, this is, in rewatching it, I, I still like the movie a lot. Mm -hmm. Some of the goofier stuff, to me, doesn't hold up. Uh, but it's obviously, I'm not the target audience for it. The 10 year old me was the target audience for it, and 10 year old me loved it. Um, but the stuff that really holds up is, like I said, the stuff that's played more straight. Um, and I love the, the kind of dark cinematography, the backlighting. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the stuff that really holds up, and the goofy stuff doesn't, which is why I think I would agree that Splinter's the best character, because up until the very end, when he's like, I made the fun, <laughs> and you roll your eyes. <laughs> Everything else with it is played so straight, yeah. but it's this big, goofy, talking rat puppet. And then that, there's that triumphant moment where he shows up on the rooftop, and the puppet's like... <laughs> It looks being so chopped up by like a broom behind yes, it or something. Yes, awkwardly, yeah. and they're just like, just shoot it fast. We've got ten seconds to get this shot. You know, he's just like, he looks so. Str it real even as <laughs> as a youngster watching this. That whole fight is pretty awkward. Uh. The 
puppet has extreme limitations, so we have to cover this with 15 different edits. Yeah. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it, it's, I don't know what they could have done other than making us, you know, dressing up a, a little person as Splinter to get some motion out of it or just standing there. But even just him standing there, he looks so awkward. It really pops me <laughs> out every time I see it. And I'll even sometimes when I'm drawing, I'll have it in the background. And it's like, you know, there's, there's your favorite moments that every time I'll like talk along with the dialogue, you know, throughout the movie. And every time at the rooftop scene, I think that's an awesome fight. Just, I'm talking about the Shredder versus all four of the turtles. That whole scene is fantastic. The lesson of you could have, you know, with the loss of but one of you, you possibly could have, you know, out overpowered me. And then as soon as Splinter shows up, I just stop what I'm doing. I, <laughs> I look at that puppet because it is so <laughs> awkward the way it's standing. That, uh, that puppet has been tortured. <laughs> that's true. That's true. He's very weak. Okay, so. good point. You're 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 saving it for me. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> he can barely stand. The character can barely stand. It's not it's not an awkward puppet. <laughs> All right, you're, you're winning me over with this. <laughs> Maybe it's not a flaw, it's a feature. <laughs> it's actually a, an improvement. Um, yeah, because he would be all broken up. They probably worked his ribs and his broke his legs or something. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, well, it's doubly, okay. it, <laughs> it's doubly distracting because I was, I was surprised at how quaint the ending is. It's like it's just four people in rubber costumes kicking Shredder on this tiny rooftop set with this giant city backdrop. I was like, that is a backdrop. And it's so obviously a backdrop. And also, I don't know, even as a kid, this kind of distracted me. You could always tell when the stunt performers were doing the, the action in the turtle costumes because they suddenly just have no oh, mobility in their face. Yeah. yeah, they're stuck in like a growl position. That's a good point, yeah. And sometimes it's overly, it's like the most severe growl they've made in the whole film. Yeah. And they're holding it, they look like they have been driven insane. <laughs> <laughs> and they can't stop doing that. And then they'll cut to a close up. Yes. Yeah. Because Leo should, of course, get a gritted face when he's really serious. Mm. But of all of them, he should have the most composure. Yeah. So then when they cut to a shot of him doing stuff and he's just like totally torqued, yeah. his teeth, are, all of his teeth are showing. Um, I did notice that. So. <laughs> to the credit of the second movie, the second movie is not a terrible film, but it is not nearly as good as the first film, at least to my interpretation it, it, of standards. It's, it's definitely more aimed directly at kids, as but, opposed to the first movie, which has a little bit broader of appeal. They attempted to bring in the original plot for the second film was that there was, I mean, it was the same plot, but there was going to be a reveal that the, uh, the scientists working in the TGRI facility were the Ultrams, which are the ones that basically Krang's race. Mm -hmm. So there would have, I don't know, potentially have been a scene where the main scientist man would have gone, you know, oh. and, and revealed a little brain thing in his stomach <laughs> to set up Krang for a future movie or something. Um, so I don't know if they, sh I don't think they shot anything like that, but that was one of the original ideas. So I think Kevin Eastman and Perry Laird were still involved in making suggestions um, like, where can we go? Where, what should we do for a second film? Um, and that was one of their ideas was to keep it, because that would still fall in line with what TCRI is in the Mirage books, yeah. um, is that it's the same race as Krang, although Krang as a character is not in there. They're called the Ultrams, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and they have like android bodies that can be disguised as a human, and they have the brain and the stomach. Well, they're not very friendly. But yeah, that's where, like, I think Baxter takes his Mouser inventions there to pitch it to them because he knows that they're a high tech company and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and Baxter's just like a regular human. He's not mutated as a fly and stuff. Um, but that's where the Mousers would come about. So, I, they were attempting to make the second movie go into some similar parallel storylines with uh, the Mirage uh, books. But maybe that was just a bridge too far for us to reveal at the end of the movie a crane thing in his belly. Like all the parents would have been like, what? <laughs> <laughs> e Eastman and Laird, they really seemed to give a shit about their vision when they made that first one. Why didn't they care for the second one? Or did they care, or what, what was going on? I think it was the speed at which it was, I think it was done in a year, or just over a year, the second movie well, was. Well, that was, yeah, so, New Line Cinema. That was their model at the time. They had the Freddy Krueger movies coming out every year. Yeah. And I think they were trying to, to do that with the Ninja out. Turtles. So I think that Eastman or Laird had to be, this might have been around the time that they were being sued every 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what were they being sued for? Basically for people trying to get a cash grab, a mm. settlement out of the deal. So oh, it would okay. be, 
I don't know the specifics. That's not something that Kevin's told me particular. I'm just, I've read interviews and heard interviews where they talk about it, but um, it would be somebody who claimed that they had an idea for, you know, ninja animals or something. Oh. And, um, or, you know, I had an idea once of a guy who did things. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thus, you took that because you have a guy who does things, you know. As much money as they had, they were just such a prime target for that type of, um, I think, uh, overly litigious, mm. you know, uh, irrelevant sort of law lawsuits. I, I had I invented the idea of middle-aged Buddha beetles. <laughs> right. And yeah, and, your, and now we're talking about something that's... What was that? There was a ninja... I mean, there was a ton of ninja Kung turtle. Kung Fu kangaroos, biker, biker mice, mice from, from Mars. Mars. But there was, like, big bad Beetleborgs? Yeah. Is that that same era? I, wasn't that more of a Power Rangers ripoff? Maybe. I don't know. And a little bit of both. Sure. A little bit of column A, a little bit of column yeah. B. <laughs> Street sharks. Yeah. Yeah, there was yeah, there a ton was, of Ninja Turtles ripoffs. And Battletoads, I'll say it. Yeah. At the end, or I'm sorry, at the very beginning of the second film, uh, April O'Neil, who's not nearly as charismatic as the original April O'Neil, who had a, a beautiful, brilliant smile. Whoever the actress was in the first Ninja Turtles film, she had a beautiful smile. It just made you feel like you knew her, you know, immediately. Mm, I'm in love. I've seen her at conventions. I've never spoken to her, but she oh, really? still has that uh, smile. She... Oh, what's her name? Judith Hoag is the actress. Yes, it is. You're right. And her, uh, the chemistry with her and uh, Elias Koteas is Casey Jones. Mm -hmm. Again, all the stuff in the farmhouse. It's mm -hmm. the best stuff of the movie. Good stuff. Yeah, it's kind of like calling her lighting. babe princess, and she gets mad, and I'll fix it myself. That's okay. I'll take care of it myself. Fine. That's up to you. Just don't come around here asking for my help anymore. I just know at the end of that scene, and I wonder if this was unintentional, he goes and he sits down on that bench, or on that swing, on the mm -hmm. porch, and it, one side just collapses. <laughs> and if, it, it doesn't feel like that was something that was meant to happen. It feels like an accident. <laughs> but he went with it. The actor yeah. went with it, so there's, they left it in the There's a movie. slight smirk on his mouth, so I wonder if he just felt like... Because if he broke character, it would be unusable. Yeah. And so if maybe he was this close to breaking character. Well, yeah, he whatever. like looks up. Yeah. And it's it's a, if it was an accident and he stuck with it, it was yeah. like perfect. Yeah. Um, but it, in the second movie, April O'Neil now is a different actress. I'm not putting her down, but I, I think the first the uh, Hogue <laughs> had had the, uh, the the best sort of chemistry or the best screen presence. But anyway, so in the second film, April O'Neil walks in to the apartment where the turtles are, and she's like, "Where's Splinter?" And oh. One of the turtles says, like, oh, he's, he's up on the roof. He's been up on the roof ever since he saw your report. Doing what? Coming. Huh? Oh, there's such a long pause before he finishes a yes. statement. To a decision. What's he been doing up there? Coming. <laughs> to, to a, a decision. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't watch the second movie very often. So just a couple days ago, I watched it. I was watching and I was drawing and that made me stop and go, what the fuck? Like, what did he just... Coming. Coming. <laughs> what? I don't remember that from the film. For an um, hour, yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. <laughs> you know, I've never even seen the third one. Uh, that was when I knew I grew up. I, when I didn't even want to see it in the theater. Did that even hit theaters? I thought that went straight to video. No, that came to theaters. Okay. But it looks so, like they didn't have the Jim Henson company doing the, the animatronics and they look awful. So H Jim Henson Studios was involved in the second one then? Because yeah. they looked like the same sculpts, but a little bit more cartoony They're They're a little, the yeah, like the edges are, are shaved off a little bit. They look yeah. a little more kid friendly. But it was, Their eyes are like a little bigger yeah. in the second movie and they have a little bit more cutesiness in their in their expressions and stuff. Yeah, they yeah. look they all look a little bit more like Michelangelo looks in the first yeah, movie. I agree. Um, but then yeah, you get to the third movie and they have like weird liver spots all over. <laughs> Do you think I could possibly live without a single microchip? And their mouths just kind of open and close. Like a flap. Yeah. That first movie really grabbed all the best elements of the Mirage comics, of the cartoon, of making a great movie at a relatively low budget with shadows and camera angles that favor the Ninja Turtles so that you can't always see that really hideous looking scene that's across their neck. You see it a few times. It's pretty apparent yeah. in some yes. parts, yeah. And, and it looks like they've been, like their neck <laughs> has been sliced and then they survived. I, I think the idea is that it's just supposed to look like wrinkles or something. I've so always that's excused the, it as wrinkles. Yeah, that's okay. fine. So that's the Ninja Turtles yes. movie, I guess. Um, Coming. <gasps> So, in 2014, it was the first time I met you in person, and I, I came on the set, 
a space cop the movie and classic movie classic movie yeah beloved <laughs> the Almost first as time beloved is ninja turtles 3 <laughs> <laughs> um but the first time i met you you were in space cop gear automatically very intimidating but <laughs> deal me in this is solitaire <laughs> The rest of the day after you had shot your scenes, you and I were extras in the background of every single shot. Do you remember this of the bar? Yeah. Oh so, yeah, you're the lead of the movie and you're also a background <laughs> extra in the same scene. <laughs> Which I think is great. I had a great time. <laughs> but the reason I bring it up is because that was probably the primary topic of our conversation was we were talking about Ninja Turtles. So this was like our first conversation other than the, our lines in the movie right. together, um, was us sitting in the background, kind of making sure our heads weren't in the shot. It was just our figures and us talking about, I was sketching a space cop thing on the bottom of the release form <laughs> and uh, talking about the Ninja Turtles and just our love for the comics and what they turned into. And this was before I drew anything with the Ninja Turtles. This was, I feel like this is some sort of- Were you not doing the TMNT versus uh, no, Batman yet? That didn't happen until late 2015. Oh shit. And so October, 2014 was whenever I came in for the space cop thing. And then that same visit was when we reviewed how to become a teenage ninja, that oh, VHS, yeah. <laughs> where we had our first conversation about the Ninja Turtles on camera. It was like a fresh conversation, like a replay of a conversation we just had at the bar. Do you remember in that second Ninja Turtles movie? When yeah, do you remember do Vanilla Ice? Was do you remember the, the Vanilla Ice, the ninja rap? Go ninja, go ninja, go. Frank Miller wrote that. <laughs> He wrote the lyrics to that song. Did you know that? <laughs> I had the biggest, it tickled me so much whenever I had jokingly said that, or one of us said, Frank Miller had written the lyrics oh, yeah. to the Vanilla Ice, Go Ninja, Go Ninja, Go. <laughs> and I had, I know I was the one who made the joke of like updating his Wikipedia. I'm gonna update his Wikipedia page. That actually happened. People have oh, been yeah, updating yeah. his Wikipedia. <laughs> I, I'm sure as a joke, but a persisting joke that still sometimes happens that he, <laughs> that Frank Miller wrote the lyrics to Go Ninja Go. <laughs> Definitely do not go to Wikipedia and go to Frank Miller's Wikipedia. Don't do this. And add that he wrote the ninja rap from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2. <laughs> that, would don't. Be, that would be wrong. Yes. Fake news. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs>